Well, good morning, everyone. We have special guests in our audience here today. We have teens, young people, young, young adults, I'll call them. Um, they are certainly much closer to transitioning into adulthood than childhood. How's that? Or at least they should be. Uh, and then those of us at my age start transitioning back into our childhood. So as you get a little, you get a little older, you know, it's kind of like do that uh, in your maturity level. Uh, and of course, if you ask my wife, my maturity level has never actually gone up much. I'm still, still childish in some respects. Um, so we do a very quick review here. Um, for some reason, this thing is weird. Get back to this, and okay. All right. So uh, quick review. This is part four. Uh, of how to train up a child, but part one was a house divided, and that is get your house together, mom and dad, figure it out, and, and become one in the home. Uh, part two was authority, uh, leadership, and the stress that all of that causes. <clears throat> and so there's always stress where there's authority involved, and yet without authority, there is destruction in its path, okay? So if you don't have it, and, and obviously I'm referring to a proper authority, you know, just uh, dictatorships and things along that line are cer certainly different, but uh, an authority figure should, should also strive to have integrity, should have, uh, strive to ensure that those uh, within the household or at work or wherever you may be uh, are being bettered by your actions. Not, it's not about you, it's about them. If you're a dad in the home, it's not about you. It's not about everybody serving you. It's about you being a servant leader, meaning that you're trying to make them better. Okay, so that's what you're, uh, that's what you, uh, Concentrate your time and, and energy on. And then we got into child training. <clears throat> and I didn't cover a lot about the details of discipline uh, because, you know, different parents have different ideas about what that might be. But I would encourage you to study that out. Uh, there's a biblical means of, you know, generally a biblical means of discipline. Uh, and that, that means is using the rod. Uh, that is not abuse. Uh, it's not intended to be abuse. It's not a freelance or a, an open invitation to abuse or to uh, wail at your kids or do whatever it is. There's a, there's a proper way of doing that. We went over some of that. And I'll relate this a uh, quick story. So for those of you uh, who have young kids still at home, uh, you need to be thinking about what they're going to be like when they're five and six years old. And so uh, our first day in Hawaii, when my wife and I went over there, uh, we had to, had to go to Walmart. I mean, you've got to check out Walmart wherever you, wherever you travel at. <clears throat> and uh, so apparently in the store, my wife had heard this fairly good fight between, you know, some kid, you know, just screaming. It's not unusual to hear that in the store. You know, they want something and they're screaming because they didn't get it. But I didn't really pay attention to it. But as we were coming back out to our car, there was a lady parked there. <clears throat> she had a, uh, a four-door pickup truck, and in the back was the, the car seat for, for the kid. And the kid turns out to be, she was probably a five-year-old girl. and uh, and she probably weighed, I don't know, 40, 45 pounds. Uh, but Beta was like, oh, that's the one, because you could hear the kids screaming all over across the parking lot. And as we got closer, it was an actual all-out fight to get the kid into the car seat. And the child kept trying to lean out of the vehicle and get back in the buggy, and I, don't, I couldn't make out a word she was saying. She was just in a, a, a complete screaming fit. Mom was doing all she could do physically to get the child to get into the car seat so she could buckle her. And it was a fight. It was a physical fight. There was absolutely no respect for the mom. There was no respect for anything about calming herself down and getting control of her own emotions, all of this. And the mom was not even trying to discuss it. I, probably the kid was way beyond that. But this turned into a physical fight. Now I'm going to say to this for this reason. We talk about why spanking might be abuse, and everybody can discuss that, okay? Proper, I don't believe proper ad, uh, administering of the rod and out of love is, is abuse. What will be abuse one day is mom won't be able to win this fight, okay? And actually, you're sitting here thinking, well, how come, you know, a 145-pound mom or whatever she was couldn't, couldn't physically win the fight with her five-year-old daughter? And the answer is she probably could. But what does that take? What does it take to physically win a fight with your kid? And then, does that end up becoming abuse? 
all right, because you've had to physically get into an altercation with your five-year-old daughter and hold her arms and pin her down and get into all of this and probably having to hold her tight enough to create bruising and actual, potentially, real injury. Real injury because you've had a fight. So I'm going to tell you, part three, have from uh, child training, you better get a handle on it if you don't have it. If you've got a child who will physically enter into an altercation with you and they are young, you better break that now. Now, most of you know we have eight kids and six of them were boys, and it wasn't, they didn't have to get that old before they could physically take me. And I can tell you, by the time they were 12 years old, as a dad, I didn't want to be in a physical fight with them. That doesn't mean I couldn't have won. Maybe I could. But what does it take? What does it take to win that fight? And if you're a parent and you're in that fight and you win it physically, you've already lost. You lost it because you were in it, a place you should have never been. So if you're not actively teaching your children, small ones on up now, you better get with it. And now part four is from childhood to adulthood. The teen years, this is the fun stuff, right? The time of transition. So their teens are in here. Uh, this, is for, this is for everyone, including me. So let's, uh, in, in the Bible, let's turn to chapter, uh, uh, the second chapter of Titus. And this will be our key verse for the teen years. Pastor House taught on this not too long ago, actually, quite in depth. So much more in depth than I'll actually be doing the kind of the uh, in depth of Titus 2. But you'll see in here the reason we've chosen this. But in Titus chapter 2, it says, But to speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they may be in behavior, behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing themselves a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. There's a lot in that verse. There's a lot in that verse. What we're going to pull out of that is, first of all, is that we're going to talk about a lot of these issues. And one of them is, is young people aren't expected to grow up today. It's interesting. Uh, I went down to pick up a washer and dryer yesterday. For, uh, Kristen and Ryan found a used one, and the people were moving out. And actually, they had left their uh, high school-aged daughter to kind of close out business at here. They had moved to South Carolina. I know. I love your face there, Dave. Dave Dave's got this shocked face, like, you know, that's, that's crazy. I mean, she was fine. And they had a, a, another friend there, you know, a guy from, you know, an adult guy from down the road and, and a couple other people there. And so we went and took care of the washer and dryer. But anyway, um, asking the young girl, you know, what, what's she doing? She, well, she's staying here while her parents live in, in South Carolina. She's going to go to school here. She's going to blah, 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 go to college, uh, do running start now. And then she's going to go to college. And I said, what are you going to do in college? She said, I don't know. Where do you want to go to college? I don't know. So what's the goal? She said, you know, I kind of want to enjoy that time. Like college is party time. College is, oh, I get to lay back and enjoy four more years of no responsibility. Four more years of don't really have to do much, just get to have fun. And that's an experience today that young people in America are being trained as like their birthright. Like they have a right for mom and dad to pay for them to go to college so they can extend their I'm not responsible to be anything or do anything or produce anything. I just get to enjoy life four more years, right? And that's a problem. It's a problem in society. It's a problem in our culture, but it's, it's certainly a problem to some degree uh, across the world. So we're going to discuss some of that. Uh, we're going to discuss the idea of learning from each, each other. And here's one of the other dangers of our culture. Who's got the greatest influence on your teenagers, you or their peers? Their peers. Their peers. Now, that doesn't necessarily always mean bad things. Sometimes their peers could be doing good things. And here's one of the other interesting fallacies I always find about adulthood or parents or parenting teenagers is you always want to make sure your kids are hanging out with the right crowd, right? What if your kid is the wrong crowd? What if your kid is the one with the bad influence? 
What if they're the leader of the bad influence? And I'll tell you some other thing that you can, you can bank on because it's 100% true. When you look at a youth group, Pastor House has preached on this too. When you look at a youth group, whoever is the most charismatic leader is who your children are going to listen to. Now, is it your child the charismatic leader or not? But if it's not your child, who are they following? And is that charismatic leader of that peer group a good influence or a bad influence? And who are the influences in their life? Because if they spend their time around bad influence, they themselves will be a bad influence. You can't help that. You are going to be the product of who and what you spend your, who you spend your time with and what you spend your time doing. That is what makes you. You cannot come to church one day a week, listen to a little bit of preaching while you're texting, and become the person that you should be. You're going, to be the cut, you're going to be the person that society tells you that will make you popular. That's exactly where you're going to end up at. And then we're going to talk about um, relationships within the home through the teen years. Because there, there certainly can be some stress there, right? So, we'll get right into that. <clears throat> As children begin to grow up, they were going to begin to think and express thoughts and desires contrary to their parents. How many parents have experienced that with their teenagers? Wow. I'm expecting a hand over here, and I'm not seeing it. <laughs> Pastor's mom and dad never experienced any of that. I love it. I, <laughs> okay, thank you. I, that's kind of the answer I was expecting, but I didn't see the hand go up. I was like, okay, all right. So they're better than I was, because we, we had some of that in our home, okay? Uh, and so they're going to challenge what they've been taught in a lot of areas. But primarily, if you've been bringing them to church, they're going to start to challenge what you've taught them about the faith. Why? Because that's the most important thing in their life. If they have any sense at all about what's important in life, they're going to want to discuss faith. And they're not necessarily going to buy your faith at face value. Nor should you try to sell it at face value. It's not yours to sell. And it's not yours to own. They need to get it, gain it, and they need to struggle with it, and they need to come out to their own decisions. Okay? Because if you just, as a dad, think that you're going to squish that in your home, and I'm not saying you shouldn't make them come to school, church, you should. You live under my roof, you come to church. That's the way it is. Now, you may not believe it, you may not like it, but you're coming to church. That's one thing. But understanding that you cannot force your faith down their throat and make them real. They have to fight with that on their own. And you should be engaged in that with them. In other words, when they express doubt and they don't necessarily agree, what kind of discussion are you capable of having? Because are you the tyrannical parent who just says, we're not discussing that? Well, that means you're the mental midget in the room most likely. Okay, because you should be smart enough and you should be secure enough and strong enough to have the discussion with your kids when they're expressing thoughts contrary to your own. It doesn't mean that they get to decide to do what they, they want to in your home, but if they walk out of that home and they haven't settled some of that for themselves, the world will settle it for them. Okay, and here's what's interesting. Teenagers like the idea of becoming unique. Is that really where they're at? Pastor, tell me. Do they want to be unique or do they want to fit in? They want to fit in. It's kind of crazy, but everybody talks about, I, I just I want to be different. I don't want to be like everybody else. No, it's actually you're lying to yourself. You want to be like everybody else because you want to fit in. You want to be accepted. And that's not a bad thing. That's human nature. I mean, who wants to be, you know, exiled to the Isle of Patmos, for goodness sake? You know, I don't. God hasn't spoken to me about sitting on the island and writing a book. So if I get exiled to the Isle of Patmos by myself, I'm going to be a little bit bored. It'll be hard. And as a teenager, it's really hard to be outside the group. Okay? So be, careful, be ready for those discussions. And secondly, by always entertaining the discussion with your children and having the ability to have that discussion respectfully, honestly, 
you keep the door open for your children to discuss it with you, okay? When you shut it down, they will find someone else to talk to because they need to do that. Secondly, in this, in this idea of having this discussion about their faith, they're going to mo most likely go through a phase or a discussion at least or a thought in their mind about their own salvation. Was it real or not? As a parent, you don't just sit there and say, oh, no, no, you got saved, I remember that. Don't answer the question for them. That has to be theirs. They have to answer that because the salvation took place between them and God. You weren't their intermediary. You could have been an instructor. You could have been a teacher, and you should be those things. But you can't stand between them and Jesus Christ and say, I've taken care of that for you, child. You got saved. I was there. The whole church saw it. Well, the whole church can see a lot of things. But is it real to you? If it's not, lead them through that. And Pastor House, I hate to use this, but he's talked about his own doubts of salvation up here from the pulpit. Sean has. Most young people and most people at some point in time will go through that, that situation. Be, be a parent who can sit down and talk through that and allow them to have that doubt and work through that with them. But the answer for their salvation is theirs. And it's not yours. If you try to own it, you're taking a place that you don't belong, and that is the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to them about their salvation, don't try to shut it off. Let, him, let the Holy Spirit work. The next thing you can help them through that is, though, you can sit down, and when you're having these discussions with them, and when they pray, is have them write down their, their thoughts about that when they got saved. So it's something they can go back and reference and say, yeah, okay, that's, that's what was happening that day. Okay, I have I've went through a, a time of doubting my salvation, struggled with it, prayed about it a lot, okay, and, and ultimately came through that being stronger. So sometimes that's a, it's a great scenario to go through to actually learn that next step and to come away with that security. Next thing they're going to be experiencing as they grow up in, this, in these years is the social challenges. Social challenges. Right? How do I look? Am I handsome? Am I attractive? Right? Am I beautiful? Am I the man? Right? Any of that? Am I liked? Do people like me? Or am I disliked? Remember we talked about child training. If you do not teach your kids to be likable, they probably won't be liked. So when they're little, teach them to be likable. So as they grow up, they can be more likable. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do whatever the group wants them to do to be likable. What you would really like is if your child is the right kind of influence, is to show them how to take the lead. Then the whole group can follow the right kind of leader, right? Rather than letting them sit on the back burner. Next question, do I fit in? Or why did God make me this way? I'll tell you, if you're, if you're in the, uh, the fashion or the cosmetics in, in industry, you've got to love today. How many, how many of you walked into, a, into Macy's or something like that and had to walk through the perfume place? How many of you about want to throw up on the other side of that? I mean, it's not, I don't dislike perfume, but when you have like 9,000 versions of it all coming out in the air at the same time, it's pretty, pretty overwhelming. Uh, in, in Seoul, uh, South Korea, in their airport there, at Seoul Incheon Airport, there are these huge perfume stores and there must be 30 of them in the same airport. And they're huge. They're, they're, they're as big as this auditorium, each of them. I'm like, how much, how much perfume do people buy? Makeup. Look at the makeup. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? So how I look makes a difference. And most of that, not all of it, but most of it's marketed to women. Your young ladies are going to be wondering, how do I look? As parents, help them with that. Talk them through about their godly appearance and how to look attractive in a modest fashion and proper and to display a spirit that shows beauty. If you've got a whining toddler girl <clears throat> and she grows up to be a teenage whiner, she's not pretty. And I don't care what kind of face you stuck on her. I mean, you look at some of this stuff that goes on on TV nowadays or whatever, or you knock on doors out here, and you see people answering the door, and they're all made up, but they've got an attitude. You're like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. 
Is there a guy in here who would want to marry a girl with a sour attitude? I, I, no. Not a real guy. And if you're a real guy and, I, and you can't see past her looks and notice the sour attitude, you better be paying attention to what mom and dad say about her. You better go to mom and dad and mom and dad, daughters, you better go to mom and dad and find out about the guy. Right? So those are things that are real things. You better figure it out. They go through physical changes, primarily puberty. Okay? Now, this is an interesting thing about parents. Sometimes parents are their kids' worst enemy. And that is, sometimes parents share secrets about their kids' life in public. It's not funny. If that child grew up and they wet the bed for a period of time in life, that's not uncommon. It ain't like the biggest thing in the world. But when they're teenagers and you're a parent and you say that out loud in front of their peers, it's the biggest thing in the world right then. And you're as a parent, oh my goodness, what a violation of trust that is. If your kids are talking to you about things that are real, like a daughter comes to you and says, I might have a crush on so-and-so, or I like so-and-so, or, or, or the young man comes to you and says, I like so-and-so girl, don't you share that as a parent? Not with her parents or his parents or anybody else, and you definitely don't share it in the middle of the teenage group. And you don't ridicule it. Those are real emotions and real feelings. Whether you like to give them credit, credit, uh, uh, credibility or not, they're real. Don't violate that trust. Do not make fun of your young people in front of other people. Your kids, boy, they're in a vulnerable time. Protect that. And when they're talking with you about real things, that's, that's between you and them. And I will tell you that our, our teenage, our kids, they shared things with my wife they didn't share with me. And my wife didn't always just share the, everything either. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes it was things I needed to know about. Sometimes I didn't need to know about it. And there was no reason to break the confidentiality. Right? As the dad is like, what am I going to do with that information? And this is something that everybody in the church should be thinking about, and I've said it so many times from up here. If you are not part of the problem, not part of the solution, then you're not part of the conversation. That's the way it should go. Right? Anything else beyond being in the problem or being part of the solution is called gossip. And guess what? Parents gossip about their children. And if you are, stop. I don't have a better solution for you. Just stop it. Okay? So, the whole idea here is, you as parents need to be ready to teach why we do what we do. In other words, you should have some logical explanation as to why you come to church, why you teach this, why you dress like you do, why you have your kids dress like they do, why you want your boys to have haircuts and have shorter hair, right? All of those types of things, whatever that is, be ready to discuss that in a real fashion and not just because, oh, I'm the dictator in the home, you do as I say. It may come down to that. I mean, sometimes you may provide all the logical answers that there are and all the information, and your kids still go, well, I don't agree. Well, why don't you agree? And then if they don't have a reason for why they disagree, then it's just a stupid argument. Then you shut that down. Say, I'm not going to have a stupid argument. If you want to have a real discussion, I'm here. Okay? But I've given you the answers. You can say you don't agree well and good. But if you're going to disagree, what's the basis of your disagreement? Have you noticed that happens in society today, by the way? People are so quick to get on YouTube. And by the way, they film themselves like crazy amounts of time, right? Just doing this, walking around. I mean, they walk around like this. And they're just talking mindless stupidity. And then you see it, like, later on, somebody will say, well, I don't agree. I, well, I, I probably don't agree with the whole idea. But that being said, was there a part of the conversation that you don't agree with? And if so, why is that? What is that part? In other words, teach your kids to be smart enough to have an intellectual discussion. And if your kids do, don't have information to allow them to have that, expose them to the good information, to the right information, so you can have a discussion. Nothing better than having a great intellectual discussion with your teenager. They're smart. And if they don't know something, it's probably because you haven't given them the opportunity to learn it. Or maybe as teenagers, they're too lazy to learn it. And they're so busy texting and watching YouTube or, or social media or whatever they do. We're going to get into that. Uh, the next thing is, teach your kids to have higher thoughts. In 1 Corinthians 13, <clears throat> 11, it says, When I was a child, what is this verse? I did what? Spake as a child. I understood as a child. 
I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Boy, that's a challenge today. <clears throat> People don't like to put away childish things. They like them. They like them. Video games, I would say, is probably number one on my list. You know, our boys played some video games. They had limits on it at home, you know, but, you know, that, that would have been a phase. And now that they've got families and they're growing up and they're having to earn a living and they go to work for whatever hours a week they work and went to school and did all those types of things, they didn't play a lot of video games during that time. In other words, they had to grow up a little bit. And, and I think as parents, you want your kids to grow up. So don't let them overindulge in just, just game stuff, you know, or fun stuff. <clears throat> Watching too much YouTube. Uh, watching too many movies, um, sitting around texting mindless stuff all day long. Like, I hate texting. Pick up the phone and call them. We can solve this whole thing in 30 seconds on the phone versus the next two hours of texting back and forth. That irritates me to no end. Most of my kids know when it's me texting and not Veda, even if I'm using her phone. Because my answers are like Y for yes, N for no, K for okay. That's my responses. If, you want, if it goes beyond that, call me, okay? I don't want to, other than that, I don't need to discuss it. Uh, next thing is, they should be taught to perform greater things than they've been doing. Things that are higher than they've been doing. 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 36, and I'm not going to go into all the detail, but basically, and David said to Saul, let no, man, let no man heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistines. Great story. Here's a young man who says, I can perform a greater thing. It's not because I'm older. It's not because I'm bigger. It's not because I'm smarter than any other person in the, in the army. But I have faith. And I'm willing to do something greater than what I've ever done before. Boy, young people today, you're in his class. You should be having some vision of what's greater than just hanging around. And wasting your time. Can you do something better? You just, some of you went on a missions trip. That's a great thing to do. Knock on a door. Leave a track. Talk to somebody. Better yourself. And you don't better yourself by being trained either here at the church, in your home, in school, or on YouTube by your peers. If you put a whole bunch of four-year-olds in a room together, and lock the door for 20 years, and I've said this one before, and you open the door 20 years later, are they going to be grown up? No. They'll be physically bigger. Mentally, they'll be the same. They'll be four years old. A four-year-old can't teach a four-year-old how to be an adult. And a teenager can't teach another teenager how to become an adult. It takes adults to teach teenagers. And teenagers, you should mind that. Seek adult counsel. Mom and dad should always be your first stop. And mom and dad be ready to be that first stop, at least the first stop. So train your children to have mature thoughts. Train your children to be sober-minded. Now, this is not the idea. What does it mean to be sober-minded? Who's got an idea what that means? Pastor House, I'm not going to call on you. Who's got an idea of what it means to be sober-minded? Some of you, Okay, Dave. I'll, serious. Huh? Yeah, serious. we're serious. Okay, who else? Come on. Okay, clear. To not indulge in frivolity. Do what? To not indulge in frivolity. Okay. To not just overindulge in frivolity. Brother Stu. Relevant. Relevant. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Lots of different definitions. What? Circumspect. Circumspect. All those are good, right? Okay. To be sober-minded isn't talking about sober and not drinking or drunk. It means to actually have serious thought, right? All these, all these definitions are accurate. Serious, real thought. What? Right? Real things about the future. When, when you go up and ask a young man who's 13, 14, 15, has he thought about his future? And he's like, no. Oh, okay, nothing. No, nothing. Okay, well, you might want to start thinking about it, right? Because those days do pass fairly quickly. And is there that day that mom and dad take you out to the front porch and just like a bird kick you out of the nest and say, there it is. That world that you're so willing to conquer is ready for you. Go get it. I'm not implying that you should kick your kids out of the nest necessarily, but I am saying is that if you're young people and you don't have any idea about what you're willing, ready to do, you should start thinking about it. And secondly, start thinking about what does it take to achieve that? What are the steps? 
right? One of the, one of the, the best books that, that Veda ever bought in homeschooling was, I think it was from Larry Biquette, but it was kind of the idea of like, get your kids to read through the book, work through it with them, because it starts to delve out what are their interests in life. What do they care about? What is something, and how does that reflect, relate to a career uh, in the world that might produce a, a, you know, a family income or, or something to support yourself? In other words, taking your interest and turning them into a pro productivity, not just something you're interested in to do nothing with it, right? How do you become interested in something? And secondly, beyond that is once you decide, hey, I want to be a fireman or I want to be this or that or whatever it is, what does it take to get there? Because if you're 13 and you think you want to be a pilot one day and you're not learning math pretty well, you're not going to get to be a pilot one day. I gave this talk all the time when I, I used to teach the uh, uh, leadership in the Coast Guard for a period of time. And one of the things I would teach the, some of the, you know, we had different levels of it, but so the incoming guys is this. I'd say, look, your, your career is pretty open. You can make a lot of decisions about your career. But I will tell you that there's some things that you can't do in the U.S. Coast Guard unless you go through this door and this door and this door. And that is, if you don't have an advanced math degree, you are not going to be a pilot. And you have to go to flight school before you're age 26. So if you're in the Coast Guard and you're now 22 and you don't have an advanced math degree, you've got a short amount of time to get one and then get accepted in to become a commissioned officer and then get accepted into flight school. And you've got four years left guess what? would have been much better if they started that when they were 14 or 15 or 16 years old, wouldn't it? Yeah, they'd have been further ahead. There are things in life that your kids are closing the doors to right now, and you as parents don't even care. You're not even paying attention. You're not even engaged enough in their life to help them make decisions about their future. You're just letting them go. And then one day they're going to be 20-something years old, and they'll think their whole life is in front of them, and yes, there's a lot of it. But then they might say, well, I wanted to be this. Well, you're not going to get to do that anymore. That ship has sailed. Because you closed that door when you were 13. Right? You want to be a commissioned officer, but you went out and had a felony when you were 16. And you closed that door forever and always. Right? Yeah, it was stupid. Maybe it wasn't even that big of a deal. Maybe it was a childish prank. But you as a parent better be having those discussions with your kids now because they're sobering thoughts to say your kids are literally taking doors and slamming them closed and you as a parent don't even care. You're not engaged enough to even teach them the things that they're going to need to be good at to fulfill a career that they might have an interest in. If you're a teenager in here today and you don't even have a thought about your future, you better wake up. The future is happening whether you want to engage in it or not. Okay. So, and the other idea is like, how many years do you want to live at home? I'll tell you what. <clears throat> there was a question that came to me. Is like, uh, I remember when at, at Katie, either at Katie and Josh's wedding or just before that. <clears throat> like, as a dad, don't you hate to see her go? Of course, I miss all our kids when they leave, but I'm not sad to see her go. Why? Because that's a future. And living in my home taking care of me and my wife until I did, I'm dead. There's no future for her. I don't want that for her. I'm glad she got married. I'm glad she's enjoying life. I want that for our kids. And you as a parent should be teaching that to your kids. Your job is not to say it here in the house and do what I want you to do and just take care of me. Hey, there's a future out there, and I want you to be prepared to go get it. Okay? And that's what you should be doing. Now, I'm going to read some things here, and we're going to probably close with these. And I've read this before. This is not new information here. But any, how many people know who Matthew Henry is? Pastor, I know you're going to read it. Okay. All right. Some others do. Okay. What was, what's he primarily known for? Okay. That's Patrick Henry, but... <laughs> Bible commentary. Bible commentary, right? Yeah. Preaching. Bible, pre minister. Bible commentary. Great Bible com commentary. Doesn't necessarily mean you agree with everything. But today we look at 20, are 20 year old people today kids or adults? In your mind, not, not legally, in your mind. Where are they at? Mom, dad, come on. 
Okay, in between. Yeah. Okay, mentally still working on it. My wife would tell you that she's still mentally working on me. Okay. But there's some interesting things that Matthew Henry actually spent the time to write down on his 20th birthday. And I'm going to read just a few of them. This is a whole two pages, but this is just a, a few excerpts from it. And, and I read this quite often because I can tell you when I was 20, I never had a thought like this deep in my life at the age of 20. So I'm not sitting up here saying I had it all figured out at 20. I didn't. But Matthew Henry had a lot figured out. So here's some of his notes from his 20th birthday, his thoughts that he wrote down. Number one, that I am endued with a rational, immortal soul capable of serving God here and enjoying Him hereafter and was not made as the beast that perished. How many 20-year-olds think about that? How many 40-year-olds think about that? Number two, that I have been born in a place and time of gospel light, that I have had the Scriptures and the means of understanding them by daily expositions and many good look, books, and that I have had a heart to give myself to and delight in the study of them. First of all, he's an eloquent writer. Secondly, it's a pretty deep thought. But how many people in here today are grateful for the ability to read and to have the Scriptures at your fingertips and other many good books, as he would say? Number three, that God hath inclined my heart to devote and dedicate myself to Him and to His service and the service of His church and the work of ministry, if ever He shall please be pleased to use me. He's grateful for that and thankful for it. Number five, uh, number five or four, that I have had so many sweet and precious opportunities. Now, this is a tough one. I have had so many sweet and precious opportunities and the means of grace, of Sabbaths, of sermons, of sacraments, and have enjoyed not only the ordinances themselves, which are the shell, but the communion with God, which is the kernel. In other words, the heart of it. Right? The heart of it. How many of us are thankful for the opportunity to come to church? How many of us struggle sometimes sitting here for messages? I'll be honest. Sometimes it's hard. Right? you got things maybe going on in your life, and it's a little hard to sit here and concentrate. How many teenagers are just glad to be able to sit here and listen to the services and listen to the God's Word? Lastly, the last one I have, it says, and that I have had some sight of the majesty of God, the sweetness of Christ, the evil of sin, the worth of my soul, the vanity of the world, and the reality and weight of invisible things. That's a 20-year-old young man writes thoughts like that. How did he get there? Did he just wake up one day and say, wow, today I'm sober-minded. I'm, I'm, I'm serious-minded. I actually have... No, this is a life where he has spent his time thinking on weightier matters and the things that are truly important. And you do not get there by accident, parents, teenagers. If you don't have serious thoughts, and you can't have serious thoughts, and you've never practiced yourself to have serious thoughts, you ought to start. You know why? Because whether you know how to think seriously or not, the world is advancing. And not necessarily in the right direction. And you're not prepared for it if you don't know how to think seriously and have some sober thoughts. Next week, I think I'm teaching next week anyway, we're going to be talking about influencers. And yes, there's a couple of different kinds, but one of them is in the social media world, obviously. And I'm just going to tease you a little bit with this. So uh, what, is it, what is an influencer in today's social media world? What's the definition? Anybody, know, anybody got one? Uh, someone with a large following of people online. Okay. That's... They set a trend. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if you look it up, you can look it up for yourselves. Look up the definition of social media influencer. And there's, quite, there's a few different definitions, actually. But one of them that shocked me was this. Uh, one of them is a social influencer or social media influencer is someone who has a reputation of authority or expertise in a particular area. Does anybody... No, that didn't come out in his definition. Does, do most of you think of social, these social media influencers as having an expertise in an area? No. no, no. Not necessarily. Most of them are educated beyond the ability to use an iPhone 
and to turn it into a video. And then they turn that into dollars because there's a whole bunch of your young people and some of them in this church that follow them. That's exactly how they make money. Because you know what should be happening to them for doing all those stupid videos? They should be living in a box. <laughs> in a cold and rainy place. <laughs> and no duct tape. <laughs> they should be sitting in there trying to hold it together. The only reason that anyone would ever aspire any idea of expertise to them is because somebody else gave them credibility in that area. Because they talk a lot about it. It doesn't make them an expert at all. But I thought that was an interesting one. Like I, I would have never had any idea that these people had any expertise in anything. I mean, most of them that talk all the time have no expertise. And then there is the other one that uh, Peter brought up. It says, influencer social media users who have a significant number of followers and use their platform to market various goods and services based on brand partnerships. We all know about the Bud Light partnership that kind of went haywire. If you didn't follow that, I thought it was kind of entertaining. Uh, what's not entertaining about it is this young person, that, uh, uh, that guy uh, who makes himself up and dresses like a woman and all this other stuff, right, it is, apparently had a following of a couple of million people. A couple of million people following a person who is completely confused in life. What kind of expertise does a person that's, that, uh, that's basically confused about basic anatomy, what kind of expertise can they have? None. Zero. It's actually some negative number that I can't even talk about. It's a negative intelligence quotient. Or are they so smart because they're the one walking around with a few million dollars in their pocket, right? What they figured out is if I become completely crazy and show myself on YouTube enough times and people start following me, I can make millions of dollars. And here's what's funny, and I'm going to close with this story. But back in the 80s, who, who knows uh, uh, the bakers, uh, the preachers, the bakers? Okay. Tam Tammy Faye and Jim. Okay. Back, so uh, anyway, I was uh, in, in Yorktown, Virginia. I was a senior instructor there. And I had a bunch of guys on my staff. And, and one morning, they all came up to me and go, what do you think of Jim and Tammy Baker? I was like, who are they? You don't know them? I'm like, no. Well, we thought you were a Christian. I am. I mean, you've got a Bible on your desk. I do. I share the Scriptures frequently when people ask me advice personal, on, a, on a personal level. But you don't know Jim and Tammy? No, I don't know who they are. Who are they? Oh, man, they're these famous Christian preacher couple that basically embezzled a bunch of money. And you don't know them? I was like, why would I know them? They're not in my church. And they were, all these guys that worked for me were so shocked that I didn't know who these people were. I'm like, I don't follow those idiots. And, I, and some of them may be smart people. I don't follow them. Why? They're not my pastor. And they're not in my church. And they have zero influence over me. And so today I'm going to tell you, if you are following somebody online, young people, or you look at somebody and you wish your life was like theirs, you do not know them. You do not know them. You know what they want you to know about them. That's all you know. You know the reason that I always go to local pastors for advice? is because I see how Pastor House lives. I can go talk to him honestly about a, in, a, in a real conversation because I know who he is. I can see what he does. I'm not following him around, but you can generally look at his life and say, yeah, he's our pastor, and he lives a good life. And he lives a righteous life. And I want to go talk to him about those things. I'm not going to go tune into YouTube and look up some preacher across the nation from here and listen to him and go, oh, ha, what a great guy. Pastor, I think he's right and you're wrong. You're stupid. Now, if you search it out in Scripture and you want to have a discussion about right and wrong, it's great. Have that with Pastor Howe. Have it with Pastor John, Pastor Mike, any of them. It doesn't matter. But have the conversation. But you better study it for yourself. If you bring, I tell you, if I was a pastor and somebody brought the guy across the nation said this, you don't know him from Adam. How much money does he make by posting all this stuff on YouTube? How many commercials are there in between his little messages? Right? And who's paying for those? Right? I'll give you some idea. Okay? 
influence. If you, as a teenager, are seeking influence outside your mom and dad and your local church and people that your mom and dad approve of, then you are blowing. And you are setting yourself up for this terrible future of destruction. There should be no influencers in your life other than the ones that are godly and God-ordained. And that's it. It doesn't mean that you can't learn math from a math book that's not necessarily written by a Christian. Math is math, if it's real math. That's okay. There's places to go get real information. How many of you want to be, by the way, how many of you want to be uh, a marine engineer? I don't expect to see it. You want to be a marine engineer? Okay. Nobody wants to be a marine engineer like I was. Although it's a good living. But it's a tough job. My kids know I was basically working about 24-7 for years. Not always awake, but thinking. But the reality is, is that there's things you can do with your life that actually produce real results. Family income. And most of those social media influences are just destroying your life. You should stay away from them. As a mom and dad, and this is a place where I would disagree with the experts, but we're going to talk about this article next week. It's four pages long, and I've got some stuff highlighted. We're going to get into that. We're going to talk a lot about influence next week, not just social media influence, but in general influence and, and where it comes from and what it means in your life and what it means to mom and dad. And mom and dad, if you're not familiar with the technology out there, you better up, you better, better up your game. You better get involved and better ask somebody, it's like, what does it mean for this or that? And, and, I, and I'll tell you, as a grandparent, I have to go look at stuff all the time. It's like, I don't even know what that means. There's stuff I've never even heard of. I didn't know there were social media influencers until probably a year ago. Apparently, they already made a few million dollars by the time I came onto the scene to even look at it. Oh, well. All right, it's all the time we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had today, and I just pray that you'd bless in the morning service now. Lord, go with us and bless us, and I pray that if there's one here today who's not saved, that today they would be saved, Lord, that you'd speak to their hearts and draw them unto you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all for your time and attention.